Crusader Kings 3's DLC of tours and tournaments just launched, and with it, we get a whole brand new patch that brings a ton of new content in addition to the DLC's content. So if you've not played Crusader Kings 3 for quite a bit, now is the absolute best time to get into it, as a lot of the base mechanics have changed, as well as a ton of new ones added in. So in this video today, I'm gonna to give you a high level overview of those new mechanics, how they operate and how you kind of navigate them in the new patch, and then close the video out talking about the Tours and Tournaments DLC, as well as kind of giving you my review of it. Now, in my typical fashion of upfronting the knowledge in my video, I'm gonna just give you my hard and fast opinion of Tours and Tournaments, and then if you want, you can navigate to the uh, chapters in the timeline below, or in the description, to just jump to the review if you wanna hear my full uh, uh, thoughts on it. But, <clears throat> my opinion for the cost of the DLC, which is uh, $29.99 at the making, as of the making of this video, um, what Tours and Tournaments adds into the game are the new, well, Tours and Tournaments, right? That's the two biggest things. The third thing that it adds in is the accolades. So those are the three big, um, uh, I guess, content drops of the DLC. And all three are actually really awesome additions to the game. They are really awesome improvements to the game and they, they do a ton of cool stuff. Like the actual tournaments portion is very, very fun, especially kind of building out people to go into it. But um, the hard and fast of this is that I do not think it is worth $30. I don't think you should buy it on its own. And that's my personal opinion. I think if you're going to get the DLC, get the chapter two bundle. It's as of the making of this video, it's $35 and it gets you the DLC plus the next two DLCs that are coming out, Wards and Wardens, and then the, uh, um, not Fate of Iberia, but it's it's something Persia. It's it's basically a revamp to the Middle East and the Indus River Valley. So I would, it, pretty much clan cultures in general are wrapped up into that. I would 100% recommend that over the $30 price tag of this DLC. Now, unfortunately, I just don't think that if the base game is 50 bucks, the DLC doesn't give me $20 less than the base game's worth of content, in my personal opinion. I had the same thoughts about the Royal Court. Royal Court was really cool, but it just didn't really kind of drive home for me. So that's the down and dirty of this video. If that's all you wanted to know as far as a review goes of the game, of the DLC, then that's all you really needed to do. You can go ahead and shut the video down, but before you do, please don't forget to like, comment, and or subscribe. All those things do help me out in a very huge way. You can pick up the DLC using my Nexus store in the description below, but honestly, um, it's on an 80% off uh, sale for most of the things on Paradox right now, so please do get it on Steam. Um, if you do really wanna support the channel, it's down there, but just do what's best for your wallet. But as always, guys, let's get started here on the Tours and Tournaments DLC as well as free patch improvements to Crusader Kings 3. So as we're going to go through this showcasing of the uh, patch update, I'm going to just freshly boot up a campaign to show off some of these features. And we're going to be playing as Apulia here, which is, of course, my favorite um, campaign in the game. <laughs> so one of the first things I really want to talk about are vassals as well as buildings. Those are the two big things that have reworked with the patch. And we're gonna go over here into our realm, and we're gonna click on vassals. So vassals now we see as we normally saw before, plenty of information on them, but now we get these little tiny blips next to their name. We have what are called vassal stances. And a vassal stance is basically how this vassal views certain things that you do, weighing positively or negatively against your actions. So vassals in this stance will like and dislike the same things. For example, all glory hound vassals dislike when you lose wars. And there are six total vassal stances. We're going to go down here to courtly, which is going to give them court positions, create new titles, and invite them to feast activities. Those things give them bonuses. They like that. But they dislike when you give them titles to lowborn characters, marry a low, lowborn character, or disinherit non-disputed heirs. So... If you start to take kind of the general min-max actions of your game, right, when you say, oh, you know what, I'm just going to marry this person because they've got an inheritable trait. Well, that's going to piss off a courtly vassal. Or, you know what, I'm going to disinherit my son because I've got five sons and I want to I min-max a specific one. So, as it, as it says right there, they prefer social and compassionate heirs with a high diplomacy skill. Parochial here is going to be more towards stewardship so that if you construct or upgrade holdings make them guardians of family close family use the domestic affairs counselor tasks they love those things but they hate high crown authority and they uh, hate declaring non-trivial wars glory hound here um let me see does it 
Okay, I didn't realize I would show some. Um, but for Gloryhound here, we have, as you would assume, someone who like in any way, shape, or form martial stuff. So any partition succession law uh, achieves victory in offensive wars, invites him to hunt activities. So that's important. Has any partition succession law. And one thing I'm going to be saying a lot in this video here is that this patch tries to break the min-max of CK3. So if you've always approached the game by going down the blood legacy and trying to make super children, looking for congenital traits and all those things, the game is now trying to work against you because it's trying to create random elements within your court that don't really want that. So the typical approach here, right, is to get to primogenitor and get away from that, the partition succession laws. Well, if you have a lot of Gloryhound vassals, they're just not going to like that. And this seems to be kind of geared off of um, their, uh, not even their primary stat. So I don't really know how this is like, okay, so this guy's parochial, right? Which is high stewardship. He's a righteous planner, uh, which gives a certain vassal stance here. Or uh, Count Robert here, spineless rav uh, uh, ravener, which gives a vassal stance. So I said I didn't know, but this wasn't in a, an earlier build. So <laughs> now we can see exactly how they get <laughs> their vassal stance. It's d dictated by their personality, which is randomized, right? So these things, this guy just so happens to have high marshal, and he has the glory hound vassal stance. But that's not always a one-to-one. -one. As you can see here, Count Roger, or Roger, um, he has high does not have high stewardship, stewardship, but he has a vassal stance of parochial. Our other ones here are Zealot, which is going to be, of course, towards learning. And they like when you construct or upgrade temple holding, succeed with the learn language scheme, it has virtuous traits, which is really cool, goes on a pilgrimage activity. But they dislike when you ask the head of faith for gold or have sinful traits. Minority here is a different one uh, than the others. So they prefer honorable and compassionate heirs, preferably of another faith or culture that can of their current liege, right? Anyone that's kind of like in the minority. Minority vassals, when their liege, uh, like when their liege uses the promote cultural acceptance counselor task, and they dislike when you convert the faith or culture of a county, has, cr how cr uh, has high crown authority. So if you're playing the fate of Iberia or doing the Iberian struggle, and minority is how you you typically kind of approach any type of um, county that has a different culture or religion than yours, you'd usually appoint a vassal that is now going to have minority vassal stance. So this is no longer that easy kind of approach to the game where you're just going to throw your vassal's opinions to the wind because they're really easy to sway or gift away. They're either 100% into you or 100% against you. Now your little individual actions are really going to dictate these things. Minor landholders here. Um, these are pretty much anyone that is baron tier or lower. Um, public sometimes falls into this, I believe. But they, they uh, like when you have low crown authority, like everyone does. Like I, <laughs> they should love that. But they dislike when you revoke baronies, which is a very common min-maxing thing, and have high crown authority. So vassal stances here, as, I, as I've said, it really does change the way the game plays. In addition to that too, if we go down here, we can see our buildings. And our buildings are now also a little bit differently. You can see here that we no longer have the typical style of, hey, this gives a flat bonus to your troops. Now you have to station things, which we'll go into when we talk about military in a little bit here. And it does a lot of things that are different. So blacksmiths now, they reduce the cost of holding a grand tournament. Dual cost in this uh, contest in this holding is, is reduced by 50%. Um, a contest, not cost. Uh, but station men-at-arms is plus 10%, and holding taxes are increased by 4%. So you can see now that these are a little bit different, right? Be uh, these are not... The typical kind of, hey, you know, you're going to make a cattle pasture and that's going to give you random bonuses to your cavalry units or whatever it is. Stables, for example, let's go ahead and put this at its highest level. You can see that it helps towards grand tournaments with joust, horse, race, and melee contests in the holding and enables the superior mounts travel option. So this is, uh, buildings now have a bit more of a direct effect on the game and less of a passive one in the sense that um, it used to be, you know, you just build whatever maintains you the max amount of tax income and maybe a little bit of things here and there. Now you're kind of focusing these buildings based off of specific needs you have for your 
military, for the types of tournaments you want to walk or uh, 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 do, for travel speed, stuff like that. Um, there's other ones here that are not, um, superior mounts is one travel option, but there's a whole bunch of other ones. But you can see now that this is much, much different. And also, too, it does reduce the danger in your locations whenever you travel. And we're going to talk about that, too. Don't, don't you worry. But that on a high level is how both the vassal stances work. And I think I've maybe over explained on a high level for vassal stances as well as the new buildings in the CK3 patch. Before we move into anything else, I just quickly want to jump into some UI updates that have happened here. So if I go ahead and press tab, open up the current situation, you can see that these now all have little contextual blips next to the text that gives us an immediate idea of what's going on. Without even reading any of this, I know there's something about a child, there's something about negotiations, or I'm sorry, something about alliances. Um, there's something about men-at-arms up there, there's a war thing going on, there's a knight thing going on. So it's nice that I can just kind of look at this very quickly and in my own brain prioritize for myself, like, you know, oh man, I saw the knight symbol, what does this mean? Oh, crap, okay, I need to get six more knights. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's abysmal. Um, but this is something that we've gotten before, but now there are more symbols for the actions you can do against other characters or for other characters. Every single thing has a... Um, a little icon next to it. It didn't used to have that. It used to have you know, sway, send gift, um, ask to take vows, murder, and prison. Those things are grant titles, dismiss. Those things had um, symbols, but now every single thing does, which is quite nice. And it just kind of makes navigating things, again, a lot more of a visual experience and less of a reading experience. So you can just kind of push through stuff. But that's just kind of a general update to the UI. There's other things here and there that I, that I haven't mentioned. Um, like, for example... The, um, the courtier section here, their aptitude, whenever you deal with a situation that tells you, hey, you can hire this person as a physician or an antiquarian, whatever, it now tells you what their aptitude is in that actual dialogue box if you encounter that event. And the breakdown of information here is a lot more detailed now, now for a court position. So that's a very nice little improvement. Another big UI change I wanted to talk about too is the full screen barbershop. It's just now in the game. You can download the mod if you want, but it's also just now in the game by default, and we can do every little thing. And a lot of the clothing has been added from a lot of the other clothing mods, like the community something pack, the CPC, CPE. Um, a lot of those things are now just kind of in here by default, which is great. So you can really kind of have a lot of fun making a character how you want and exactly setting up the scene. Again, just like you want it to be with names and everything. This is 100% exactly like we've been able to do, maybe even a little bit better of a, of a UI for it. Um, we can have the actual coat of arms in there, whatever we want to do and however we want to do it, which is really fun, right? You can really have a lot of fun with this and get yourself a little hide UI, stuff like that. Change out the, uh, the lighting and everything. Also, that's kind of one thing I personally as a content creator that I love is the ability to put them on a green screen that the uh, full screen bar barbershop allows me to do so then just delete the background and use it for thumbnails. But still, it's it's really fun. I get to have a lot of a lot of great times with this. And I think you guys too will too. I think this is probably one of the most downloaded mods that is now just integrated into the base game that I absolutely love. Having talked about some of the new men at arms stuff, I want to quickly jump into that here. So we're going to press F3 to bring up our military. And without going into the conversation about knights and accolades, um, quick heads up, and I'll talk about it again when we get to that section. If you use the Knight Manager mod, shut it off until it gets updated because it will disappear. It'll it'll turn off the accolades section. So heads up there. So for your Men at Arms now, you can see they have this red text that says Unstationed. Now if I click this and then press this button, uh, I'm sorry, press this button, it'll allow me to station my Men at Arms. But there's a way to do it outside of the current situations um, dialog box. You click on your Men at Arms not stationed in any holding, you press the little thing here, and we're going to go ahead and station them. So you can see, I can see all the holdings that I can station them at and what it will do. And this is really nice. So I can get, again, at a quick glance, what's going on, but I now know where I'm going to maybe focus on specific buildings to really increase these benefits, right? Okay, we have really good uh, toughness here and really good damage here, but maybe I really want to go over the board here. But it can get in a good idea too where this is coming from from my mot and from my simple earthworks. So we'll place one right here, and that just means that they're stationed there, they're getting benefits from it. It doesn't mean anything in the sen a sense that, like, okay, um, they're permanently defending it or anything like that here. Station Men at Arm receives bonuses to effectiveness by being stationed in a holding. They, the buildings pretty much provide these bonuses, and you can station at any time except during war or if the holding is occupied. 
If a holding is lost, any station men at arms will be unstationed. You don't lose them or anything like that. So it's pretty much just a way to specifically fine tune a bonus to a specific unit of men at arms. It's not a way to like have them defend the location or if you lose the location, you don't lose them, anything like that. So again, we can click here and click here. So you can see this is now unable to be stationed at or I replace them if I do station right there. There we go. And you can see then where exactly they're stationed and the effects that it has on it. It's a really nice improvement to the military system that I, I very, very, very much enjoy. Outside of that, military is roughly the same. Um, combat seems to be different in the sense that it's a little bit more streamlined um, when you go and jump into any disembarkations. Um, it's 30 days, but doesn't feel like the, the normal 30 days. There's something they change with disembarkation that it's not the, as brutal as it once was before, but it still is quite a huge disadvantage. So you want to be kind of mindful of that. Let's move on to another subject here. But probably one of the largest things that was added with the patch is the regent ability or the power sharing. So if I look at this character, um, well, I'll press this button. This is my power sharing window. It is in my realm tab by pressing F2. It is there. I can see everything. And with this menu, I basically assign someone as my regent. And you are, the regent takes over when you do literally anything that removes you from the court. If you are on a hunt of any kind, anything in the activity section, if you go to war and you're commanding an army, your regent is there. So this regent is quite, quite important because if you get a really bad regent in this place, even though this guy may be an excellent regent that has a terrible loyalty, it's not going to go well for you because the regent over time will try to build the tip these scales of power. So basically they swing by the the um, regent doing actions for themselves as um, the diarch, you know, diarch to your liege, um, and trying to push power for themselves. They do not need to relinquish it when you come back, and they pretty much usurp you. <laughs> and you can see that, it, like, let's say that uh, Count Roger here were to die. Well, this person's going to take over as regent, unless I change things around. And you've got your loyalty that breaks into three separate categories. Selfless, which means they pretty much are going to do exactly what you want. Self-interested, no, they're pretty much going to do exactly what they want with a little bit of your stuff in between. And situational, they're just going to kind of pivot around as they see. Diarchs might use borrowed powers, will generally either split mandate benefits with their liege or ignore their mandate entirely and might, and might need bribing to give up their office if the scales of power suit them. So these... Scales of power are what happen when the diarch starts to use their ability to, um, their borrowed powers is what they're called. They'll push further onto the scale. As you can see, diarchs can attempt to imprison fellow vassals and courtiers within the realm of their liege. Diarchs can instantly try to forge claims in the titles of the fellow vassals. Diarchs can entrench their regency, becoming harder to remove and accessing more borrowed powers. Diarchs can get a free extra change to their vassal contract if it can still be edited. So borrowed powers here uh, basically are special powers that they are going to get as the diarch that allow them to do stuff, include revoking titles from fellow vassals or siphoning away gold from their liege. Many borrowed powers give the liege an opportunity to veto them. And then you can actually swing these um, back in your favor um, when they are in control. So once they're a regent, there's a button here that appears that allows you to swing the scales um, by either spending your gold or your fame or your um, piety here to basically kind of swing things back in your favor. So you pretty much want to always find someone who is selfless. And it gives you an idea of why they're selfless, right? But um, if they are self-interested, it's going to give me a liege stress loss penalty. So right now I get a bonus, right? So plus 10%. If they were self-interested, this would be a plus 10%. Or I'm sorry, minus 10%. Well, vice versa. Sorry. I'm saying that I would gain stress faster if they were self-interested. So it's a very interesting system. It's really cool because you have separate mandates you can enact. And these mandates are basically, they do them as they see fit. Uh, when a diarch does their job well, they both swing the scales of power towards themselves and generate strife with their fellow vassals. So you can see, because some of these say, Extra gold, free domain development, two really cool things, but feudal contracts adjusted in the liege's favor. That might be really bad for you, right? Maybe you've got a couple vassals that are really teetering on the edge of a revolution. They're quite large. Well, this guy is going to go ahead and push those feudal contracts to your favor as the liege, but even though that was giving you a little bit of uh, 
uh, buying room in their uh, opinion of you. So it can be really a double-edged sword. Swell armies, beneficial men at arm modifiers, beneficial levy modifiers, and skilled knight courtiers. A promote authority. Characters and counties leaving factions. Boosted crown authority, which can be good or bad, right? Boosted counselor opinion. So a lot of really cool things that you can do with this. And it really kind of changes what happens when you go on any of these activities, which is going to be our next subject to talk about. Because being on an activity is not just a simple like, oh, you're on an activity, no big deal, like it was before. No, it can absolutely tank your game depending upon how things go. And importantly too, those activities are not short. You go on, it takes you, like I'd say a short, a, a close, like a, a, um, actual like geographically close proximity activity takes you 230 some odd days. I was playing as Matilda. I went to right over here to something in Provence and I it was 230 days. I, I was gone for 230 days. It was just a feast. So the region is in power for a long time and you really want to focus on that. And if you have a liege, well, yeah, I should probably actually switch to a character that is, who is his, who is his regent? I don't know if it shows me that in here. Um, or his diarch, I suppose. But what you would do here is let's switch over to one of these characters. And this allows me to take a look at, oh, I could have pressed this button to find out where the diarch is, right? I'm really great. I'm really great at what I do. Um, so this is the this is the actual region, and I'm in this. So if that character takes over, he might do things um, for or against me or whatever it is. Let's go over here. So he's right there, and this gives me some special abilities um, when I am the liege's power sharing. You can see right here. I'd say the other largest portion of the update is the change to activities. So the distinguishing portion here between the DLC and the patch is grand activity. Grand activity is for tours and tournaments, and we'll talk about those in tours and tournaments. But activities now are vastly different because you now go on a feast, a hunt, or a pilgrimage, and it changes everything. So let's say I click on feast. And this allows me to do all these actions here, right? May gain courtly vassal opinion, may gain prestige, participants may gain attending a character opinion, so on and so forth. But the big thing here is eager reveler. Now, and again, we'll talk about this in a sec, you can get traits and these traits can level up. Well, yeah, it'll be in its own section. But the cool thing here is if you want the eager reveler trait, host a feast. If you want the hunter trait, then go on a hunt. If you want the pilgrim uh, trait, then go on a pilgrimage. And that would be intuitive prior to this point, but it was always RNG. You never knew if you were gonna get the trait or not. And now you know you're gonna get it and how you can actually influence it is done through these actions. So it's a lot of fun. And also too, there's a lot of different variety of how this works. You don't just simply press, okay, let's go on a feast and the feast happens. You press plan feast. I choose to cut the uh, kind of feast here. We can have a murder feast, dude. You can recreate the red wedding. I mean, you can actually do that in the murder wedding, but that's not here right now. Um, or we can do the same thing with hunts. You can choose different types. Um, like for example, here hunting, then allows me to choose locations that are beneficial to hunt in, right? Like, oh, this is just got on the hills and high development, so it kind of washes itself out. But take a look over here, right? Oh, plus two. Uh, plus three and minus one, and I'm saying plus three because of the total amount of pluses there. So you get to do these individual hunts in these locations, and you might even see, get events that happen that say, hey, uh, one of your scouts sighted a um, deer here or, or wolves here or something like that, and it becomes part of a sighting in this location that then further increases things. So we're going to go ahead and select here on Lanciano. And now this is how we travel to the locations. So we can see where we're going to go, right? You can see these little these little lines of what, what, what destination is going to happen for us. You know what, even? Let's do this. Yeah, I, wa I wanted to see these little blips. So you do get ways to kind of shut off your route. If you have a particularly long way to go, you can click these things and kind of custom build out the route in which you travel, which then dictates the terrain on which you travel and then dictates the dangers in which you encounter. So if I look over here, this is red, right? Oh man, village center minus 10, but hills plus 45. So 
chance of danger is 24%. And that is then reflected right here on dangers in route. High chance, medium chance, and then low chance of danger. I have to emphasize so much on this portion here. Spend whatever you can, do whatever you need to do to reduce the amount of dangers in your travels. I cannot tell you the amount of times I've gone on these events now and just lost the entire group. Um, I was playing as Brittany. I went into the English Channel. The second I touched the goddamn English Channel, the entire boat sunk. I lost like 15 people. So the traveling is far more dangerous. And we've heard about this plenty of times throughout medieval history of people just going from one location to the other and someone just kind of fell off their horse and got a contusion and died. So those things are way more prevalent now and you need to spend a lot of time and effort making sure you have the proper caravan master, which is a new uh, court position that helps out with movement speed, supply limit. Um, big thing here is army movement speed. It helps out a lot with that. And that caravan master, uh, let's just choose a person here for the sake of this video. Um, you can see that they help out with speed and safety. So those things are really, really, really crucial to you because, you know, this guy's going to go way slower, but wow, it's way safer. So take a look at those things as you're building out this position here because you do want to make sure i would take the longest route possible if it guaranteed my safety of course that means your region is in position for the time that you're gone so keep be mindful of those things and like i said remember you're you're on these travels for a long time total travel time is five months right now at 107 percent speed um let's just choose let's put this person in just to show just to reflect what the speed does so a point, so that's 15 more speed here, and that's a flat percentage increase. So when you see 15 speed, think of it as a plus 15% to that uh, percentage right there, because we went from 107, plus 15 is 122. And you can see that all reflected right there. Um, so it's important to just look at those things. You then also have travel options. You can hire experienced captains and stuff like that. So mercenary guard, and it shows me, I get an increase to my speed and plus 20 to safety. And so my 26 safety, now it's going to go up to 46 and I remove the dangers here, which is nice. Or you know what? If you don't really have the money to do that, I can see that we're dealing with hills, hills and forests. Well, how about this uh, higher mountaineer? He's going to reduce danger in hills, mountains and desert mountains. So we'll press this button. OK, well, we still only have one. That's pretty nice. Uh, we still have a little bit of danger here. So let's hire a do I have the forester. Yeah, forest guide. Boom. OK, so we we only spent eight gold. And we got rid of the danger here, so that's quite nice, versus our mercenary guards, which would have increased our safety substantially, but maybe I just don't have the money for it. So those two are things to kind of consider, that you're, it's going to make your travels a lot more expensive, right? This cost, The total cost goes from 104 well, up to now 124, and let's throw higher cultural ambassadors. Now it's 134, and you can get different ones, like I was saying, from different buildings, superior mounts, train knights, armaments, make haste, circumspect. So a lot of really cool stuff comes with these travel options, and it's a really, really cool system. I really like it, because you then have the intent of what happens in the event. I didn't mean for that to rhyme. I suck at rhyming. Uh, change the hunt intent. So for myself, personally, I'm going to do it to lower my stress or slay a specific beast to help bring um, a fame to my to my land or murder someone. We can choose someone who's going to come on this hunt and we're going to we're going to murder the hell out of this guy or let's seduce him instead or we befriend him. So this is a really cool way to get uh, befriend schemes done without having that diplomacy skill, right? Befriend which is not hard to get, but still my point is you can use this to befriend people if you're, say, hosting a tournament or attending a tournament you can, or attending a hunt or feast of someone else's. You can use the befriend scheme to maybe befriend a really important um, future vassal or future uh, alliance that's set up, and you use that to then solidify a marriage because you've boosted your opinion without having to sway them from across the land. So it's a really cool way to pull the strings of things without directly being involved in them, and I like it a lot. Um, cool, of course. Yes. Uh, anything here else? Oh, yeah. Also, activity options. So, you have basically these three tier activity options for each one of your actions, and these increase success chance or decrease success chance depending on how much money you want to spend. So we spend nothing, and you know it just it's there. Or increases success chance and effect increases with court servants court amenities, and then increase success chance for flushing gangs. 
Uh, or the party size. We get more prestige if more people are, are in attendance seeing me do all these amazing things. Like this one here, much more prestige on completion. All courtiers and guests join that you have access to. So, and you can take a look. Uh, intimate party, two people in my entourage. Substantial party, my entire court is here. So, you can really have, and that, of course, leans back into our intent. And now I've got my whole court here and I can choose who I want to do and what I want to do. So uh, you use this to your best advantage to try to get the specific things that you want. You also have managed guests that are going to be coming. You can you can go down through here and say, you know what? Gloryhound vassals appreciate the support and will gain opinion. Each attending hunter will slightly increase the success chance, hunter being the actual trait. So you can go down this and say, well, you know what? Uh, let's include my rivals or my lovers or my close family. Um, or let's remove glory hound vassals. Let's remove court hunters and friends and lieges and vassals and fellow vassals and courtiers. So it's like you get to really kind of choose how this works and how and who comes on these um, individual hunts, which is a lot of fun. Over 20 guests have been invited. Some will choose to decline your invitation. How dare they? They never would. But activities is a huge part of this. It is free with the... Um, the patch and it includes all three of your major ones feasts hunts and pilgrimage it does not apply to grand activities which are part of the dlc now i want to talk about trait changes traits for the most part now have levels attached to them so i've gone ahead and done a search on novice physician by pressing the character finder and turning my relation to all but i'm going to show you something usually if i type in physician we can see well hold on i have to remove it to remove this if I type in physician, I can see in the past novice physician, physician, and renowned physician. So this is kind of something that I like and I don't like. I love that this exists in the game because I can now level up physician and it allows me to do more things. I think that's really cool. But I cannot search based off of someone's experience expended into a specific trait, which I hate. So herbalist here, lifestyle trait, gardener, lifestyle trait. Oh, well here is our novice physician. It is a, has a trait path. Some traits offer several paths, each of which will improve the trait in different ways. Earning trait experience is required to move further down a trait path. So this guy just has a flat one. That's all he's got. He just has a novice physician. But if we kind of look at more of these, oh, she's got a little bit more experience here, right? She's got 15. Uh, let's keep looking down, see if we find anyone substantially more. Oh, well, this person actually has one. So with level one, they now get an additional bit of learning. They now get a small health boost. And you can see that reflected right here. And this now says physician, parenthetical notation, novice physician. So you don't have to look at the bar. You can just, okay, that's, that's a physician. That's a novice. That's a novice. Novice. If I organize this by probably, nope. I say probably if I organize this by, okay, this is still a novice. But either way, if I, I can't seem to get one, but a renowned physician would say renowned physician right here with parenthetical notation, novice physician. It's just annoying that you cannot search individually by the renowned physician. Ah, here we go. So I can't search by this person. They just come up in this list. So it is an annoying portion of it, but this is how you find your physicians now. But this extends to other things. Um, you saw the hunt, right? The hunt um, trait now, ha Oop. now has Venator, which gives you all these bonuses up to this one. The sound of the horns, the dogs, the prey. By bow or stable, there is no thrill to compare with bringing down a savage beast. <laughs> like one does. Um, and it has a plenty of stuff like glory, hound, vassal opinion, stress loss, health boost, prowess. Um, and same thing here with falconeer. And there are a lot of different ways. Let me click on my knights and see if I can see some of these other guys. I don't think I can see any of them here that have it. There's another one here that applies to the tournaments. There we go. And you can see that this applies foot, bow, horse, and wit, which are the four categories used in the advanced tournaments, but you can go progress through these two to help you out with more stuff as well. Um, so a really, really cool mechanic that has been added in and, and helps kind of make traits feel a little bit like they've got something going for them. They have kind of an RPG aspect to them now, and I really, really do actually like that. I think it's a much needed system that I didn't, I didn't even think I did need that. I didn't think to myself, oh, I want to see the actual tangible experience bar of when someone progresses to one point to the next. And now you can see that. And I, I actually find that I love that bit of transparency.
So I've switched over to Brittany for this conversation, but now we're into the DLC. We're going to talk about the grand activities. This allows us to do a tour, which is going to increase county control, popular opinion, stress loss, a tournament, which is a tournament, and a grand wedding. And grand weddings, I think, are probably one of the coolest things here because it allows you to kind of punch out of your bracket. So for example here, as the Duke of Brittany, I want to solidify a really strong alliance. So we're going to click find spouse and I'm going to organize this by alliance power. Now, of course, the Normans are going to be super strong because they have that massive army so they can go invade England. But my next possible candidate is the Duchy of Bohemia, which is still no slouch. Same thing with Bavaria. But then after that, we have the Kingdom of Denmark. The Grand Wedding is going to increase my marriage acceptance chance. Let's go ahead and click that button. And we're going to organize this by alliance power just one more time to make sure. Well, now I can actually marry into the the uh, the princess of Norway. For some reason, I almost said England. And that's not far off as far as like where that, that progression point goes. Of course, he's got sons that, that can go off to. But still, I can get to the second child of King Harold right away. The grand wedding there allows me to do it, right? Minus nine. Grand wedding is going to give me that plus 40. And there we go. I can actually make that happen. So this allows you to kind of punch outside your bracket, which I think is a really cool situation. And weddings in and of themselves, just like the other grand activities, have a plethora, a plethora of things that happen that occur during the actual event that gives you tons of benefits. So let's jump back over to the Byzantines or maybe even Apulia to talk about some other grand activities. So just like the other events, we're going to plan this tournament by selecting location. We're going to go over here, and then we get to choose the contests that occur at this um, tournament. So I can say, well, maybe you know, we're going to do one of Joust, and I'm going to add in maybe a horse race or a board game for wit. And it shows me the type of aptitude needed to do so. Um, like, okay, this is going to knit, this is a foot contest. This is going to be uh, wit. This is going to be over here. We have both horse and uh, foot archery so we have a lot of different things we can do so maybe we'll just click archery and we can see if we're either going to spectate or participate one thing to know is that this right now i'm participating this right now i'm participating it and there's some ui portions of this that it's not obvious that you are doing one or the other and i'll show that off in a second here so it tells me okay it's gonna cost 300 i'm the emperor of the byzantine empire who cares and I can see, of course, where I'm going to travel. I'm just going to go ahead and just pop some of these in here real quick. Just doesn't matter. I just want to get to the actual portion of it to show you guys off. We have the intent yet again, where we can do whatever we want. This is a great way to recruit knights or get some triumph going, whatever it is. We'll just press recruit. We can select a champion here, whoever we want to kind of be the person leading the... Um, leading the, the, the way for us. Oh my God, I do not have anyone good for this <laughs> Oh gosh, Ooh, let's just go with some of as prime as possible. It doesn't matter. It's a video. <laughs> and we can just go ahead and, okay, the biggest, the prize artifacts will be of very high quality. So when you do the actual uh, uh, tournament here, we have quite a few things that happen. So this is going to kick off in five months, uh, four months, sorry. And it's going to go through each one of these situations. And what happens here is in between each event and before each event as you arrive um i'm just going to go ahead and click through some of these um it allows me to um choose one of these locations these locations will allow me to do certain things like the temple here pray for victory uh, to test your faith artisan quarters you know you can maintain your artifacts get new clothes and improve weaponry your tent camp where you can sabotage contestants a lot of cool things and then you can see here, you know, who is the favorite, I don't know why it's me, because I got nothing there. Um, you can see who the favorite contestants are, and allows you to bet on those contestants. It's a really cool system. You have all the guests that are attending, the activity log of the stuff that's going down, and that's the most important thing. All of these grand activities, even the minor activities, have a ton of side things that occur during them. And not just things that happen to you, things that happen to your vassals, things that are going to happen to lieges external to you, but things are going to happen nonstop. I can't, apparently I'm on track to qualify and I do not know why. I should not. I, I shouldn't even be allowed to drive clearly at this age. I don't even know why I'm qualifying. But we're going to go ahead and speed up through this a little bit more. Uh, where's that button? Right there. 
And here we go. We jump into our very first one, the Joust. And this allows me to place a bet and so on and so forth. I can see all of our contestants and who's fighting. Um, there is a button for that somewhere, but we're going to go ahead and press I'm ready. And all guests. And I can see here, you know, where they all rank and stuff like that. And my... Ooh, ooh, okay. Oh, great. Um, and just kind of progress toward... Apparently we're progressing very well towards victory, which I find to be extremely surprising. Um, and you have like these... You really kind of go through the whole event if you're participating. Otherwise, it's just randomly watching characters go through this, and it's like a, an, an RNG chance. Uh, a lot of it's prowess or, or martial, depending on what it is. <laughs> this is not going to go well for me either way, so let's just go with something. Um, did we make it to like the finals or something? Oh, no, we got unhorsed. Now we can see who the favored contestant is, so on and so forth. Confounded. So this is a really fun system and allows you to do all these cool things. Oh, someone died. Um, and you have a lot of fun doing it. Like I very much enjoy these grand activities. I think they're an amazing addition to the game. And I think it does a lot of fun stuff for the game as far as improving the kind of just otherwise benign things that would do. Vlad, is he from Wallachia? He's a, he's a Wallach. Good Lord, this guy is a machine. Um, but it allows you to do a lot of fun things in the time in between all this crap, which all the like individual actions, right? Which I find so fun, so fun. So now we've done this, we can go to one of these locations, like, okay, go here and reduce some stress or go here and do these little events. And I like this a lot because I can also look at like my knights and see who is really good. Um, again, this is grayed out. That doesn't mean that they are they cannot participate. It means they are not participating. This means that they are now participating. I have to press these buttons. So the uh, the grayed out thing like this, that's what they're currently doing. It's really like counterintuitive in my opinion. Um, so now they're all participating. Whereas before they were, some of them were observing. So, and if it's archery, maybe they don't actually want to participate, right? Like this guy's definitely going to participate. He's He's got it. He's got it down. So you... Counterintuitive UI choices that I'm not really a huge fan of, but it is still a really good system. I really love the Grand Activity system, and I think it's probably one of the best single improvements or additions to the game. That is a very high watermark right there. But I love it, I love it, I love it, and I think you'll enjoy the, the tournaments a whole ton. A whole goddamn ton. Now, the other big feature added in with the DLC is the Accolade system. So we're going to go over to our military, click on our Knights, and click on an Accolade. And this allows us to create an Accolade for any individual that is not landed or it's barren, it's, it's barren or lower. Like, if, they, if they're a Count, you, they cannot have an Accolade. So let's go ahead and click Michael here, my personal champion. I think it even says somewhere in here. Um, claimed a Knight... Okay, so to be an acclaimed knight, a knight must be unlanded or a baron with at least eight or more prowess. Um, an acclaimed knight must be eligible for two accolade attributes. Now they can already belong to another of their lieges acclaimed knights, which I'll talk about in a second. Oh my gosh, do not cock block me. Um, so, we would go ahead and click on Michael, and then we would click on Create Accolade. But before we do that, we have two attributes our primary and our secondary. So the primary attribute attribute here, we only have thug as an option. So these accolade attributes, basically they differ. So each potential acclaimed knight is only eligible for certain attributes, mostly based on their traits. On accolade succession, the new knight must fulfill the primary attribute, but the secondary can be changed at the loss of glory. So I'm making this guy the the TRI of the Iris. I'm sorry, I mispronounced the shit out of it. And this is because I'm sure, uh, I think Scoundrel is because he's a, uh, or Thug, I think it's because of Scoundrel. Um, you might say on here. No, it doesn't. It does not. It does not anywhere that I can see. Um, but I have Thug or the current one, Mentor. And at rank one, rank one, rank one, <laughs> number of knights plus one. Rank six, I get number of knights plus two unlocks the train commander's counselor task, occasionally higher increase of knights, a stellar experience. Adolescence of your court gains significant extra prestige and prowess. So you get this really cool ability here from these actual accolades. Scoundrel, for example, at rank six, martial per stress is plus five and mercenary higher cost reduced by 30%. Then thug is what we're going to replace our primary uh, mentor one with dread gain per tyranny. 
all the way up to imprison chance plus 25. So you can see that these are really cool ways to get these nice passive bonuses going for you. Let's go ahead and press this button again. We'll press thug and we'll press scoundrel. We'll just change it to mentor. So just to kind of show you that you can do those things. So once you press create accolade, it does cost you, of course, some fame. That accolade is present, and this character is now an acclaimed knight. This little symbol means that they are an acclaimed knight. And I can click on this, and it shows me that he's a level, it's a level one, the Serpent of Constantinople. Holy shit, that's got to be the coolest autogen name I've ever seen. <laughs> so you click on this little bad boy, and I get a breakout of the uh, what's going on here, right? The rank and the progression, the glory needed to, to get that rank. And they get glory... By, of course, winning tournaments, winning battles, defeating warriors, uh, going on specific activities, right? Like hunts and what have you. Um, however, the Accolade's glory is lowered when the Acclaimed Knight is involved in losing battles on Accolade Succession and when the Accolade becomes an inactive Accolade. So we can retire the Accolade here and it becomes inactive. The bonuses will no longer have any effect. But you have that you can do. Now, the cool thing here, though, is your successor. And the nice thing about the successor is that when you know when you press the decision here to like you know search for knights or whatever the hell uh this one search for knights um you don't always get the best people but if i press this button seek worthy successor um so it already has a potential one because there's already one in my court so if there's not one in my court this button is not is is not grayed out but it shows me exactly what's going to happen right they're going to find it's going to seek out someone that's going to serve as a knight that is less or equal to a baron prowess of eight or above and they're going to have at least one of these wrathful arbitrary impatient arrogant or reaver they have to have that trait this dude apparently he does uh, arbitrary right there so um i just get that recruit him to my court and he's good to go because he has he's just beat the threshold right so i mean yeah you can have some some lackluster knights but by and large you're going to get pretty good knights with 10 or higher um prowess which I, I actually very much enjoy i think it's a really cool way to get two really solid knights into your uh military at a really cool uh way to do so as well like i, I the acclaimed knight system i think is a, is a really fun little spicing of rp that again it's another system that i didn't know i thought i needed but now i really love so those are the two big things that have come with this dlc right your grand activities your accolades and how those really play into each other traveling is part of the, the flc even though it's a big portion of the grand activities so keep those things in mind as you kind of think about this as a whole but so how does the dlc really stack up so i'm just going to kind of keep our screen right here and for those wondering i'm using the ir terrain mod the imperator rome terrain mod that turns the water into this awesome blue glass um but this DLC is is really honestly like prior to what I said in the intro, it's a great DLC. It's really goddamn cool and it adds something to the game that is way more foundationally important and fun and interesting and it has an effect on your gameplay. Like the Royal Court, you could completely skip over it and you really it's not going to aside from the things you have to deal with, it's not going to change much. But with the grand activities, all the little things that happen in between, especially with a grand wedding, oh my god, so much stuff happens with grand weddings to, to increase and decrease opinions, create friends, seductions, all those things. A lot of those stuff, a lot of that stuff happens in these grand activities, it, even on base activities, tons of stuff happens. So it can actually very drastically change the game for you. So you do have that going. And again, I, if I have to, if I had to rate the, if this was a DLC that was a dollar, I guess that kind of throws the argument out. But I guess if this DLC was 10 or 15 bucks, I would give this DLC like a 9 out of 10 because everything's got room for improvement, right? Um, I think like the UI for some things could change and so on and so forth. But I think overall, mechanically, the things that it adds to the game is, is significant, it's awesome, and it's badass. I think the problem with the DLC though, its biggest issue is it is a $30 DLC from a $50 game. And that is my biggest pain point with the DLC. I, and again, just like Royal Court, Royal Court is a $30 DLC or $25 DLC, whatever it is. And it doesn't really do anything to the game that I don't need to do. It adds a lot of RP stuff, which I honestly, I, I've got a whole other video plan on that. I think not enough people play Crusader Kings 3 with RP in mind. I think it's too easy to fall into the min-max glove of Crusader Kings 3. And I'm glad that the patch and this DLC aim to kind of break the back of the min-max because you, you just can't do it as easily anymore. But I think that 
at 30 bucks, you just don't get what is effectively what? Like 60% more content because you're t you're, it's 60% of the cost of the game, right? More or less. And I think that that's the problem. If this DLC were even $20, I'd still say, yeah, absolutely worth it. But that 10 extra bucks is rough. So my recommendation to you is do not buy this DLC on its own. I'm sorry. I think it's a great DLC and I think it adds a ton to the game. Uh, if, if you really want to get it on its own, wait for it to be on sale. But get the Chapter 2 bundle if you want the DLC and you don't want to wait for it to be on sale. It's 35 bucks, and you get two other DLCs with it. That's where that value comes in. So if you're buying the DLC on its own, I don't think it's worth it at 30. If you're buying the DLC as the, 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 the chapter bundle, holy crap, that is a sick deal. Because you're getting a $30 DLC and two other DLCs which are gonna be valued anywhere from 10 to 20 bucks, uh, right? I think Fate was, I think Fate of Iberia is like $15. And uh, Wrath of the Northmen, I'm not sure how much that one was, the five or ten dollars. So those two things, you know, that's twenty five bucks. Let's just say that they're both ten and fifteen. Uh, on top of the thirty dollar DLC, that's fifty five dollars. So getting it for basically the other two DLC for free, that's a sick deal. I, I, that, that's the that's what really makes this DLC that much more worth it. I think though, if I were to compare this to Royal Courts, and if someone said, "Hey, gun to your head, which one are you going to choose, this or Royal Courts?" A hundred percent this. I, I think if you were only going to buy one DLC for this game, period, it would be this DLC. So I'm not saying this DLC is bad by virtue of what it delivers to the game. Nay, I'm saying, I'm saying that it delivers so much and it's a great way to get access to all these little tiny things you have to do through, okay, sway this person, befriend that person, seduce this person, start scheme on this person, do that, do this, do this. You can do it on the grand activities and it makes it way more interactive and fun in the way that the medieval world was. So I think that that is amazing and it's immersive and it's awesome. But I'm just saying again, for the price point, it's a little rough and tumble because you still, the mechanics that you're taking advantage of, by and large, already exist in the game. The brand new mechanics of the tournament themselves, the actual set in tournament, the actual accolades and the actual like uh, act of a grand wedding, those are, and the tour, I guess that's another one too, that, that's all brand new. The majority of stuff that's coming alongside this DLC are all the big things that are absolutely free for the game. So I think it's like, had had like travel been part of this or, or maybe activities as a whole, um, maybe if without the DLC, the activities were all the same as prior to the patch, then I'd say this DLC is like, yeah, you gotta get this DLC. It, hands down, 30 bucks, it's sick. It's changed everything. But now that so much of this DLC is split between the free stuff that comes with the patch, it's hard to really warrant a $30 price tag. So that's my down and dirty for uh, my opinion of the DLC. Again, I think it's amazing, just a price point issue. Um, and go ahead and let me know in the comment section below. Are, are you loving the DLC? Would you have paid for it if it was 60? Um, I think that we still need to see that uh, the struggle system stretch over here to the Byzantine Empire, to the and the nostalgics or to just other portions of the map. There's plenty of places where the struggle could exist. I give me a timestamp in the 13 or 1400s. Let me play a struggle between England and France. Give me a lot of different ones. Uh, give me a big crusade DLC. Those are some of the bigger things I wanted to see with DLC. Tours and tournaments is something that's awesome. And like I said, it adds in things to the games that I didn't think I wanted, but there are still a lot of systems that exist within the game that I think we really do need to see a facelift on. Crusades being probably the biggest one in a game called Crusader Kings. So go ahead and let me know in the comment section below how you're feeling, what other DLCs you're excited for. I, I mean, personally, I really can't wait for the Persia one because it's supposed to, it's supposed to be focused on all where does it say clan? Clan style governments. So I'm really excited to see how that changes the game, much in the same way that Northern Lords vastly changed and improved the tribal governments that we play with today. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care.